The time for our service in your street has come to an end. And now we would like to invite you to come and worship with us in the Salvation Army Citadel, Northgate. Come and join us in worship. We have already welcomed the viewers at home this morning and we are pleased to welcome you to our worship today. We're pleased that you have come along and you want to worship God with us in this way this morning. And I invite you to do that by turning your Bible to commence with to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. And we're going to commence reading from verse 1 down to verse 5. Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us today. I now invite you please to turn to song number 504. Song number 504. Lord, I make a full surrender. All I have I yield to thee. For thy love so great and tender ask the gift of me. Lord, I bring my whole affection. Claim it, take it for thine own. Safely kept by thy protection, fixed on thee alone. Song number 504, we'll stand together and with the help of the band we'll sing the three verses, please. <laughs>
you please be seated and we're going to pray together. And in our time of prayer this morning, I would invite you please to turn your songbook to song number 585. Some beautiful words that we can take for ourselves, that we can pray ourselves this morning. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. And then these beautiful words of Fanny Crosby that we'll sing in the chorus, that we'll pray in this chorus. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. With our heads bowed, let us sing these words in prayer together now. Thank you. Boy, I'm boy, words and as we speak these words in prayer let them come from your heart this morning and we're going to sing the second verse before we pray together consecrate me now to thy service lord by the power of grace divine the second verse let the words come from your heart consecrate me God and our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus and we want to praise you, Father, for as the psalmist reminded us, the Lord is good and his love endures forever and his faithfulness continues through all generations. And because of your love toward us today, Father, we, we simply want to just thank you and praise you as we come into your house this morning to worship you, we pray that the very presence of your Holy Spirit will be near, near to each of us and very real to us. We ask that you'll speak to us in this time of worship. Speak, we pray, Father, to reassure us. Speak to direct us. Speak to challenge us. Speak to comfort us. And we pray that we will be responsive and obedient to all that you say to us in our time of worship today. We do pray that this worship will be acceptable to you, that it will be the means of uplifting you 
And we ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And amen. We're going to ask our songster brigade now to come and sing for us. And they're going to sing, I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. Thank you, songsters. going to have two of our people now to share with us their personal testimony. They're going to tell us about their relationship with their Lord. And first of all, I'll ask Brenda Steer if she would speak to us. Please. Since becoming a Christian, probably one of the things I've struggled with most is trying to find what God's will for my life is. Certainly there's lots of things that are revealed directly through Scripture, but God's will for me personally is something that I want so much to know and yet so often can't seem to find. Lately when I've thought about some of the things that God may want for my life, I've been a bit scared that what he might have in mind for me is not what I might have in mind for myself. 
Although knowing God's will is so important to me, I have a weakness that says, you may not like it, so what you don't know won't hurt you. And to an extent, this has kept me at a distance from God. I feel sure that there have been lots of times when I just haven't wanted to listen. Being 21 and fast approaching middle age, there are lots of things I'd like God to reveal, but I just worry that my reactions won't be obedient. I guess so far that sounds pretty negative, but I feel positive about the fact that it's a problem that God's helped me to identify and has helped me to, began to help me to overcome it. A particular verse he's shown to me is one that, which comes from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Happy are they whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. They will be satisfied fully. Although I suppose I've known it all along, this verse just reinforces that God's will is for happiness and for satisfaction, and that it doesn't matter what I'm called to, so long as I'm obedient, I know that I'll also be happy. I also know that failing to seek after what God wants would be to deny myself that happiness and that fulfilment that he wants to give. I guess another reason why this verse has become so special to me is because it implies an acknowledgement of human weakness. It doesn't say, happy are they who do exactly what God requires. It says, happy are they whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. It suggests that as Christians, so long as the desire of our hearts is pure, then God will do the rest. Whatever I'm called to, at whatever time, for whatever reason, I know that God will equip me for his work and that there will be real joy and satisfaction in being obedient. Sometimes it's easy to become complacent and to forget about the cross and to forget about the price that was paid there. I just pray that my life will be one that remembers what Christ has done for me and that offers return love for all that he's given to me. My testimony this morning is based on my Christian commitment. And I guess like many of my friends, my Christian friends, my problem was not one of how little my commitment. I was in everything. Boy, was I committed. In my Christian immaturity, I was under the impression that it was more important and very important to be so heavily involved. I guess in some way believing, believing that the more I did, the better the person I was. And I certainly enjoyed the notoriety that I received from people. I don't believe for a moment that enthusiasm is a bad thing. I thank God for it and believe that he uses and needs enthusiastic people. But I do know that it's essential to be about what God wants. And in some cases and for some people, that's quiet, unnoticed, hard work, perhaps without any recognition. When I began to allow and acknowledge God's rightful presence in my life, I began to see that just as he promises that he is with me in everything I do, then every activity, every action, in total, is my commitment to him. I can see now that God has directed me in every aspect of my life and in my employment I am able to work directly with people and have some influence on their quality of life, often working with their needs and with their problems. And it's not always appropriate, indeed it's not etiquette in public service to talk to people about your Christian faith. And yet I know that as God has placed me in these positions, my actions can and must be the very means of expressing my faith and are the basis for my work and indeed the very reason that I am there. We're all motivated by something. I'm grateful to God for my motivation and in every aspect of my life I am working towards an absolute continuum where, regardless of my activity, be it passive or boisterous, it is the outworking of my complete commitment to God, my Lord and my Saviour. Now perhaps these words will be a surprise to some and that's why I say I'm working towards, I haven't yet attained, but I'm strengthened and encouraged by God's word and I would want to leave with you this morning some verses from Psalm 139 and they're words that tell me that Jesus, that God knows me 
and knows me very well, and I'm so pleased about that. They say this, O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. It's my prayer that God will help me to attain to the person that he wants me to be and that he will continue to be patient with me as I know he will because he loves me. Thank you, David. Now we're going to listen to the message from the band and the piece they're playing this morning is entitled When Jesus Comes to You. members of our congregation who work at the Crossroad, Salvation Army's Crossroad Youth Project. And I'm going to ask one of those people, David Eldridge, if he will come and tell us a little bit about the work he does. And then we're going to pray together for, um, for their work, for those people in need, and for those people in our community who work with those who are less fortunate than us. I'd like just briefly to... Um first tell you something about the Crossroads Project. It commenced in 1978 <clears throat> and uh, was a response by the Salvation Army to the growing numbers of homeless young people who seemed to be using the men's shelters in the city. And um, initially the response was one of developing a youth refuge in Fitzroy and from that grew a network of services for homeless young people, 
most of which focused around young people aged 15 to 25 years. And the main aim of the work is to provide young people with a stable base, a stable environment from which they can make some decisions about their own lives and from which they can have some opportunities which might otherwise be denied to them. The sorts of services that we would offer would be accommodation and each year we'd accommodate, um, I suppose we'd offer beds to each night 69 young people and about 23,000 occupied beds a year and another 12,000 young people would come to us for material aid, um, counselling, legal assistance, some form of drug referral and a range of other um, services which are very important to them at that stage of their life. We also offer recreational and camping options and give young people the opportunity to learn um, the skills that are necessary to gaining and maintaining employment. There's four people from Northcote here involved in Crossroads and working mainly in the accommodation side of things. And uh, for each one of us, it's both a, a satisfying and an enriching work. And we'd like you now to pause with us, bow, our, bow your heads as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray to you this morning. We pray to you because you're a God who loves each one of us, who cares for us, whose spirit moves in our lives, bringing out of us those feelings for others which enable us to work for you. We pray this morning, Lord, for the homeless of Australia, for homeless young people, for homeless older people. We think of families who are in distress, families who for some years may not have had adequate or stable housing. And we'd ask, Lord, that as members of your church, we would be able to in some way bring relief to those in need. We'd ask you, Lord, to help us become more aware of the needs of others, to become responsive, to not regard ourselves as the centre of the universe, but to reach out to others, offering the love that you've reached out to offer us. Be with us this morning as we reflect on those in need in this community here. We think of those who work in the community for justice and peace, and we think of those who they work with. Be with them, sharing your love, and be with us as we share this love. Enable us, Lord, to bring your reconciliation to all people. Enable us to share with you in the bringing into being of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Our second Bible reading this morning is going to be brought to us by Bandsman Les. We'd ask him to come forward and read now. The second reading this morning is taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renew renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of, think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given to you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do, do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him prophesy. If, a man's, if it is uh, serving, let him serve. It is, if it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. I'd invite you now to please to turn your songbook to song 499. Song 499. Jesus, precious Saviour, thou hast saved my soul. 
From sin's foul corruption made me fully whole. Every hour I'll serve thee, whate'er may befall, till in heaven I crown thee, King and Lord of all. All my heart I give thee, day by day, come what may, all my life I give thee, dying men to save. We'll remain seated and we'll sing with the help of the band. Thank you. As we turn to the Word of God this morning, I would like to direct your thoughts to our second Bible reading from Romans chapter 12, and especially the first verse of this reading. Therefore, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. 
Romans 12, verse 1. And as we consider this verse this morning, as we consider these words, let's just remind ourselves that when a verse or a particular passage commences with the word, therefore, it's necessary, it's really important for us to consider what has been said immediately beforehand. Very clearly, the Apostle Paul had set out how to get right and to keep right with God. He had strongly defended this free righteousness of God against all objects. Or as one Christian writer has put it in the preceding chapters, Paul has been telling us of how God has been planning and preparing for us. He tells of what God has provided for us, his children. Then Paul calls for our response to all that God has done for us. He urges us. He beseeches us. He appeals to us. He exhorts us. He implores us to respond to what God has done. I believe that there's a real sense of urgency in Paul's words. Here he is pleading, begging for us to respond to the word that God has said and to what God has done. The sense of urgency about Paul's plea could be likened to a person appealing, begging, pleading to another person standing on the roof right at the edge of a 25-storey building and about to commit suicide by jumping off. Or like a blind man in the streets of an eastern country pleading, begging for assistance, from those who are passing by. The sense of Paul's urgency in his plea could be likened to either of those two situations. The Apostle Paul really does want us to respond to what God has done for us and to respond now. Recognizing God's mercy to us in pardoning our sins into receiving us back into favour with Christ, offer your bodies, present your bodies, he says, as living sacrifices. You would be aware that there are quite a number of references in the Old Testament to sacrifices. And there are, in particular, four sacrifices. And they deal with the sin offerings and they deal with the peace offerings. Possibly the most well-known Old Testament sacrifice is that which Abraham was prepared to make in the sacrifice of his son Isaac. This boy who meant so much to him, born to he and his wife Sarah in their old age, and God called Abraham to make a burnt offering, a burnt sacrifice of his much-loved, dearly loved son Isaac. I'm sure you'll know the story recorded in Genesis chapter 22. And here with Isaac upon the altar and Abraham about to slay him, the angel of the Lord called to him not to lay a hand upon the boy. I don't believe that for one moment we can begin to understand how Abraham felt nor appreciate the cost of his sacrifice. His son who he loved and undoubtedly loved greatly, he was prepared to sacrifice him in response to the command of God. I want to tell you today that this isn't the type of sacrifice that God wants of us. This isn't the type of sacrifice referred to by the Apostle Paul, either in that reading from Romans 12. God doesn't want us to offer an animal or a bird or some expensive possession as a sacrifice. What he wants from us, what God desires of us, is to be living sacrifices. Paul implores us and he pleads with us, to give our bodies as living sacrifices. 
That's what God wants from us. That's what God desires of us. In response to His goodness toward us, in response to His provision for us, He wants living sacrifices. One of the famous bells of China is the bell in the Great Tower. And an ancient Chinese legend says that about 500 years ago, the ruler of China commanded an official to make a bell big enough so that its sound could be heard for 100 kilometers. With the assistance of tradesmen, the Mandarin made the bell, but it wasn't what was required. The brass which had been used to strengthen the voice of the bell, the gold which had been used to deepen it, and the silver that had been used to sweeten it, they had rebelled against one another. A second bell was made with the same result. It wasn't what was required by the emperor. And the Mandarin received a message from the emperor which said that if he failed a third time, thy head shall be severed from thy neck. The Mandarin's beautiful daughter feared for the safety of her father. She went and consulted an astrologer and he said to her, gold and brass will never meet in wedlock. Silver and iron shall never embrace until, until the flesh of a maiden be melted in the crucible, until the blood of that maiden be mixed with the metals as they are fused together. As the third bell was being made, the Mandarin and his daughter and his servants, the tradesmen, stood on a platform over the large pot of liquid metal. And the young maiden cried, For thy sake, O my father, as she leapt into the boiling metal. That's the reason why it's said that the sound of the bell in the great tower is deeper and is mellower and is mightier than the tones of any other bell, all because this young maiden sacrificed herself, gave herself completely. The legend has it that the Mandarin's life was saved as a result of his daughter's sacrifice. Again, I want to say that this isn't the type of sacrifice that God desires of us. The word of God said, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Living, living sacrifices. Around about the year 400 AD, Bishop John Chrysostom asked, how can the body become a sacrifice? How can it? How can the body become a sacrifice? And he went on and he answered his own question. Let the eye look at nothing evil, and it has become a sacrifice. Let the hand do nothing lawful, and it's become a sacrifice. Let the tongue speak nothing shameful, and it's become a sacrifice. Nay, this is not sufficient. But we need the active practice of good, said the bishop. The hand must do charitable work. The mouth must bless those who curse. The ear must give attention without ceasing to divine lessons. To my mind, there isn't any doubt that the bishop summed it all up in these words. Offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. The sacrifice which we're called to make of ourselves is to be not only living, but it's to be holy, a living and a holy sacrifice. We need to remember, we need to realize that as Christians, that our bodies belong to God 
and they are to be set apart for his use. And they're not to be used as instruments of sin. It is the Apostle Peter who says in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 14, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. The call comes to you and I again today to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, holy. This is your spiritual act of worship. Dr. William Barclay in his daily study Bible says, true worship, the really spiritual worship, is the offering of one's body and all that one does with it to God. Real worship isn't the offering of elaborate prayers to God. It's not the offering to God of a liturgy, however noble, and a ritual, however magnificent. It is the offering of one's body and all that he does with it. Considering all that God has done for you, I ask you this morning, what is your response? Hearing again this call, this urging, this pleading from the Apostle Paul, what is your sacrifice? Are you prepared? Prepared to give of yourself to God so that he can use you? The call comes loud and clear to us today. To sacrifice self. What is your response? The Living Bible paraphrases this first verse of Romans chapter 12 like this. And so, dear brothers, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living sacrifice. Holy. The kind he can accept. When you think of what he's done for you, is this too much to ask? What is your response? Your response to the call of God today. When you think of what he's done for you, is this too much to ask? Let us pray. Our God and our loving Heavenly Father, as we read your word, we are reminded again today that you want us to be living sacrifices. To give of all that we are. To give of all that we have. So that you might use us in whatever way you so desire. And we pray that just as we are, that you might accept us and that you will move in our lives and that you'll make us what you want us to be. We're well aware that we have failed you, that, that we have disappointed you in the days that have passed. And we ask again for your forgiveness and pray that you will make us strong and make us what you want us to be as we commit ourselves to you again this morning. Father, we pray that you will take us and that you will continue your work in us so that we may live to bring honour and glory to you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. As we come to the conclusion of our meeting this morning, I'd invite you please to turn your songbook to song number 475. Song 475. A beautiful song of consecration, of commitment. And maybe this morning as we consider these words that we're going to sing, you will consider again your own sacrifice to God. For the chorus says, I have not much to give thee, Lord. For that great love which made thee mine, I have not much to give thee, Lord, but all I have is thine let us stand together and we'll sing verses 1 and 2. To, thank you. Song number 475. Mm -hmm. 
words that we are singing this morning and as we have mentioned, real words of commitment, of consecration and I pray that you'll make them such as we sing them just now. The third verse and the fourth followed by the chorus, I have not much to give thee Lord, but all I have is thine. And I remain standing, I'd ask you to bow your head and to close your eyes and to take the words of that song that we've been just singing, the words of the chorus, and pray them. Speak the words to God just now as we conclude our worship this morning. I have not much to give thee, Lord, for that great love which made thee mine, I have not much to give thee, Lord, but all I have is thine. Prayerfully together, 
the benediction together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Please remain standing as we listen to the band play for us the blessing. Thank you.